Hey, are you ready to go into the wild with the E A G E A G? See them mangrove day, protect them. When you walk with your things, don't let them look out for the birds and the snakes. Don't scare them. We're going on a wildlife journey to save them. Who you rolling with? No one does it like. Who cares for the coral reefs and the beach and the seas and even the trees? Who you rolling with? No one does it like. Who cares the most for the turtles and fishes and trees and all for the coral? Into the wild, into the wild, no, into the wild. Funding for this initiative was provided by the Elkhorn Marine Conservancy, dedicated to enhancing the resilience and local stewardship of Antigua's marine ecosystems through restoration, collaborative management, and conservation. Welcome to the final episode in the series of Into the Wild with the EAG. We've talked a lot about corals, what they are, why they're important, and how they are beneficial to us as humans. Now it's time to talk about their threats and what we can all do to help them with their survival. When coral polyps undergo stress, they often expel their zooxanthellae or the tiny photosynthetic cells that provide them with food. No longer benefiting from the mutualistic relationship, the coral will eventually die. This process is called coral bleaching due to the white appearance of the coral without the colorful zooxanthellae. Bleaching is often caused by warmer sea temperatures. However, there are a number of threats that cause coral stress. These threats include climate change, pollution, disease, unsustainable coastal development, and unsustainable fishing practices. Climate change and its impacts have several implications for coral reefs. The increased introduction of greenhouse gases from human activity, such as the burning of fossil fuels, raising of livestock, and deforestation contribute to climate change. These dramatically affect coral reef ecosystems. That was a lot of terms. Can we go shoreside with Sherelle to get a better understanding of all these causes and effects of climate change? Sure, let's start with a quick rundown of what causes climate change. When we do things like burn fossil fuels for energy and cut down vast amounts of forests for development, we release greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Now, let's get into how this affects coral reefs. The first effect is an increase in global temperature. This has a negative effect on corals since they require a very specific temperature range to live. The second effect is a decrease in the pH of ocean water. When too much carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, the water becomes more acidic. Coral's exoskeleton, which is made of calcium carbonate, reacts with acidic water, deteriorating the structure and making the coral polyps vulnerable. Now for the third effect. Remember that tropical corals need sunlight in order for their zooxanthellae to feed them through photosynthesis. The rising temperature causes sea level to rise, placing coral colonies at greater depths with less sunlight and potentially smothering them with sediment from increased coastal erosion. Great! Um, just great! Uh, funny enough, that leads me to my next point. Higher than normal global temperatures also provide the right conditions for much fiercer and more frequent storms. Our sister island Barbuda was devastated by Category 5 Hurricane Irma, which was the strongest hurricane ever observed in the Atlantic Ocean. Barbuda was among the worst hits of all Caribbean islands, resulting in an economic loss of over 120 million US dollars and 95% of homes were destroyed. Hazards associated with hurricanes, such as persistent waves and storm surges, can destroy delicate branching corals like staghorn and elkhorn, and cause sand to be shifted within the water column, smothering coral colonies. Hopefully, that helped explain, Janella. So now that we understand how climate change is affecting corals, we need to address some of the other threats that exist today. 
I think I can help explain. Coral reefs can be affected by many different types of pollutants such as garbage, fertilizers, pesticides and chemicals. Sometimes these pollutants are dumped directly into the water, but most often they start on land and then get washed into the sea when it rains. You mean what I use in my garden or in my shower might actually be harming corals in the sea? Yes, once these pollutants end up in our waters, they cause corals to stress. This can result in coral bleaching, disease, reduced growth and reproduction rates and even coral death. Wow, so global warming, ocean acidification, and water pollution can kill corals? Yes, girl, they have it hard. Another significant threat to coral reefs is eutrophication. Eutrophication occurs when excess nutrients enter the water and cause a boom in algal growth. These nutrients can come from fertilizers in farms and gardens, manure from livestock, and sewage runoff from septic systems in houses, hotels, and boats. When algae on reefs get fueled by these nutrient inputs, they can overgrow and kill corals. What about all this brown seaweed? Is this considered an algal bloom as well? Unfortunately, yes. When sargassum is floating in the open ocean, it acts as a great habitat for a variety of fish, juvenile turtles, and often other species. However, increased nutrients in ocean water has created large influxes of this seaweed that land on the shores of Caribbean islands. When the seaweed beaches, the coastal water becomes anoxic and flora and fauna in the water column can also die. As if that's not bad enough, Janella, it gets worse. Though these types of pollution are very harmful to coral reefs, the most upsetting of them all is plastic pollution. Pollution caused by plastic items like bottles, bags, cigarettes, and discarded fishing gear account for about 80% of all marine litter. Not only do marine organisms become entangled in plastics, Sea turtles and other organisms accidentally eat it, mistaking it for food. For example, plastic bags look very similar to jellyfish in the water. Leatherback sea turtles love to eat jellyfish and might mistake a plastic bag for a tasty snack. Eating plastic can be deadly for sea turtles. Trash can also get hooked on corals, blocking the light necessary for photosynthesis. Are we done with the threats yet? Girl, I wish. Another threat to coral reefs is overfishing and destructive fishing practices. Overfishing occurs when a species of fish is removed from the marine ecosystem faster than it can reproduce on its own. For example, many populations of parrotfish or chub are declining due to overfishing. Since chub help clean the reefs of algae, their disappearance would make coral reefs less resilient to algae overgrowth, impacting the health of this marine ecosystem and its ability to support all other forms of marine life. The use of destructive fishing practices such as net fishing, which sets or drags a fishing net across the seafloor, not only causes physical damage to corals, but also contributes to bycatch of non-target marine animals like juvenile fish, sea turtles, or even seabirds. Wow, even birds too? Imagine that now. When coral reefs are negatively impacted, this can spell trouble for coastal communities that depend on fish stocks, leading to the disruption of livelihoods of fisher folk. Another threat to coral reefs is disease. Just like us, corals are more likely to get sick when they're stressed out from things like poor water quality or high water temperatures. Many diseases in coral reef ecosystems have been linked to pollution and some are thought to be spread by boats. Diseases can also harm corals when they affect species that are beneficial to corals, like the black long-spined sea urchin. This keystone species eats algae and helps keep corals clean, so corals really suffered when a disease outbreak killed a devastating 90% of this species in the 1980s. And another urchin disease has been observed just recently in 2022. To keep coral reefs healthy, it's important that we keep our waters clean. 
In spite of the many threats and challenges faced by coral reefs today, there are still ways that our collective actions can make a difference in conserving these precious ecosystems and giving them a better chance for survival. All right, guys, that was pretty heavy. There are so many threats that coral reefs face today, but luckily, there are things that each of us can do that can remove some of the disturbances to coral reefs that could be causing damage. I know the perfect person to walk us through ways we can help. Let's consult with our very own wildlife officer, Josh. Hi everyone, I'm here to show you how we can make coral reefs happy and healthy. One, when swimming, snorkeling, or diving in the ocean, always admire marine animals and plants from afar, especially coral. Be mindful of where your feet, fins, and hands are at all times so that no part of the reef is being damaged or broken. Two, wear a reef safe personal products such as sunscreen. We learned that coral reefs are sensitive to pollutants in their environment. The ingredients found in some sunscreens can be toxic and contaminate the marine environment. Take care of your skin while also taking care of our reefs by investing in sunscreens that are non-toxic for corals. Three, throwing anchors onto marine ecosystems can cause significant physical damage. Some marine spaces also have moorings, which are permanent structures that a vessel can be secured to. Moorings provide a safe way to secure your boat while at sea without damaging the marine environment. Always make good use of them. Four, a closed season is a period of time where it is illegal to kill, sell, harvest, buy, or keep in your possession a particular species. These periods are put in place to prevent overfishing and support life around a coral reef. Most of these closed season dates are chosen to coincide with the breeding season of each of these species so that they have time to reproduce and so that they're protected while they aggregate to spawn or mate. The killing, selling, harvesting, buying or keeping in your possession of any of these species during the closed season is illegal and can result in a fine of up to 50,000 EC dollars. I know I wouldn't want to pay that. All of the steps we just discussed are called passive restoration because they allow the reef to recover naturally. Thanks so much for explaining how we can help Josh. But fortunately, this isn't all that could be done to help our coral reefs. Scientists around the world are trying to fight coral reef loss in other ways too. And this is called active restoration. Active restoration is when direct action is taken to revive degraded ecosystems. One form of active restoration being used here in Antigua and Barbuda for coral reefs is coral gardening. This is where we collect small fragments of coral from healthy reefs and then grow them in our nursery, sort of like a plant nursery, but underwater. After about a year, the coral fragments are large enough to be outplanted onto dead reef areas. This accelerates the spread of corals across areas of reef where coral has been lost or damaged in the past. When these new corals get large enough, they can even start sexually reproducing on their own, helping local and regional populations to recover. Now that you've dried yourself off and learned all there is to know about our coral reef ecosystems, here are a few key things we want you to remember. 1. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet and support a variety of marine organisms. They also provide a wide range of ecosystem services that benefit our daily lives. 2. Corals aren't plants, they're animals, and they share a mutualistic relationship with algae called zooxanthellae. 3. Coral reefs require specific conditions such as sunlight, ideal temperature, clear and clean water, and the presence of primary consumers to survive and thrive. 4. More than 75% of all coral reefs on the planet are currently threatened by a combination of stressors, including climate change, overfishing and destructive fishing, coastal development, pollution and damage. 5. If we want to protect our coral reef ecosystems here in Antigua, Barbuda and Redonda, we have to make sure we play our part. This involves disposing of trash properly, minimizing the use of fertilizers and chemicals on land so they don't run off into the ocean, using caution around reefs while boating and diving, and spreading the word. 
Now that we've given you some insight into coral reefs in Antigua and Barbuda, you're well on your way to becoming a marine ecologist who studies marine organisms, their behaviors, and interactions with the environment. We had so much fun teaching you about one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on Earth. And now that you have learned all about how you can take better care of them, we know that you will be mindful the next time you interact with this fragile ecosystem. We hope that you'll never forget how important the environment is to both humans and wildlife alike. And that you encourage your friends and family to be mindful when visiting coral reefs. It's all our responsibility to keep them healthy. On behalf of all of us at the EAG, thank you for joining us for this virtual experience. Thanks for going into the wild with the EAG. Bye! Hey! Are you ready to go into the wild with the E-A-G? E-A-G! See them mangrove, they protect them. When you walk with your things, don't left them. Look out for the birds and the